And at the end of the day, you can tell everybody to go fuck themselves. You can put it in your head, memorize the freaking key, right? And it's here. And then, you know, the classic Bitcoiner response is, oh, yeah, my Bitcoin, uh, I lost it in a boating accident. You ever heard that phrase? It's, it's kind of a trope, but what it means is, at the end of the day, if you push me too far, I lost it, it's gone, sorry. If there were no Bitcoin, we, uh, I suppose, uh, we would be uh, levered up with a lot more debt. When you don't have Bitcoin and you look at the inflation rate, your conclusion is, I need to be a net debtor. So if you, I guess you could like look at all the other com companies in the world that don't have Bitcoin and ask how do they get by, like all the Japanese conglomerates. What they do is they take on large sums of debt and they either go private with huge amounts of debt, like an LBO, or they stay public, but they, uh, they lever on huge amounts of debt because um, that, way, um, that way they're not carrying cash that's losing purchasing power on the balance sheet. And they lever up their equity. So I suppose we would be a, a very levered uh, LBO type candidate running with a very thin layer of equity and negative working capital. And uh, hoping, right, it'd be very stressful because you would be hoping that, that uh, you never have a bad quarter because if, when you're highly levered up, when you're running with $2 billion of debt and no equity, then when you get a bad quarter, you uh, default on your debt and then you end up with like Toys R Us situation or all the, all the companies went bankrupt in the past 20 years. They just have a bad year. They can't, they can't make their debt payments. The equity holders get wiped out. The creditors take over the company, and then they start to dismember it and chop it into pieces and, and uh, sell it. So it would be a pretty dark, unpleasant situation if we didn't have Bitcoin. Well, um, the, the elegance of the Bitcoin uh, protocol is that Bitcoin mining is an open... A permissionless industry that anybody can join and every two weeks the difficulty of, uh, of mining increases or decreases based upon the market dynamic. So I, I think of Bitcoin miners as the line of first defense for Bitcoin. When, um, when things go badly, either when, uh, when poor decisions are made or when uh, when acts of God take place or acts of government or nation states. The miners suffer so that the Bitcoin holders don't. So uh, do I worry about miners? Sure, if you're a miner in Iran running on, on free energy, when the government cracks down on the free energy supplement, you'll suffer. If you're a miner in China running on free or cheap electricity, when the government starts to notice that, you'll suffer. So miners will suffer. Um, when, um, when electricity costs go up, the miners will suffer. When the Bitcoin price goes up, they'll benefit. Over time, mining is going to get more difficult. It's going to get 18% more difficult every year because of the halvings. And it's going to get 50% more difficult every year because, or 75% more, some percent more because hash rate keeps coming online. And if you're entering the mining business, you're entering into a very, very competitive industry. So that's why I think um, it's better, if you have money to invest, it's better to invest the money in Bitcoin, not in a Bitcoin mining rig. I think Bitcoin mining is a business and there are counterparty risks. We just, we've seen, for example, you know, if you had mining rigs in Russia, when the Russian sanctions took place, you lost your mining rigs. Okay, so if you're in business, you can uh, have your business interests damaged by war, famine, tariff, tax, competition, entropy, you know, poor execution, 
And that's why, uh, that's why um, mining Bitcoin is not the same as holding Bitcoin. <laughs> it's a very competitive, challenging thing. But if, if uh, miners on the periphery go out of business, if, you know, when half the hash rate got wiped out in China, it didn't damage Bitcoin. It simply shifted the profitability to North America. And if, um, if uh, Bitcoin prices uh, get cut in half and if electricity rates double, it won't wipe out Bitcoin mining. It will simply squeeze out people running mining rigs that are previous to S9. The third, third generation antiquated mining rigs will find their break even point reaches one or two cents a, you know, a kilowatt hour. And if they can't buy electricity cheaper than a penny a kilowatt hour, they're not going to be profitable. So they'll shut down their hash rate. But when they shut down the hash rate, the difficulty will adjust down in order to balance the network. And the network is uh, probably a thousand times uh, higher hash rate than it needs to be to be secure. So I, I don't really worry one way or the other about Bitcoin. And as for Bitcoin miners, yeah, if I would worry about every one of them. And, and the reason I don't run a Bitcoin mining company is because it would take all my time and all my attention and I would be worrying about all of these things. But you know what? That's why we want Bitcoin mining because there are a hundred pretty large Bitcoin mining companies with CEOs and executive teams. And every one of those teams is worried about Bitcoin in Kazakhstan or in Russia or in China or in Canada or in Africa or in Texas or in California or in New York. They're all worrying and they're worrying so that we don't have to. And ultimately it's, you know, it is like the skin in your immune system. You know, it's there to catch the infection and protect you. And if you lost your skin, then you would probably not live very long. But occasionally, you know, you're, gonna, you're going to suffer a bit. And, uh, and that's just uh, part of a healthy ecosystem. I think that right now the biggest vulnerability to Bitcoin is the rest of the crypto industry. I think the 20,000 tokens that are unregistered securities, I think, I think the crypto exchanges, the, the wildcat crypto banks, all the crypto projects, all of the people trading those cryptos, all the crypto hedge funds, and then all of um, all of the negative publicity and then the negative financial outcomes that come about from, uh, from things like Terra, Luna, right? The, the meltdown of a, of a stable coin that was not stable, uh, that was traded as a commodity that was really a security that because they never declared it a security, they never actually made any fair disclosures on it. So you had an under collateralized asset, $50 billion worth of something trading with a billion or $2 billion of equity, right? 50 X levered without disclosure uh, with uh, a lot of DeFi exchanges and other crypto exchanges allowing those tokens to trade and marketing them uh, with leverage. And I think that that got cross collateralized into Bitcoin and so the volatility of Bitcoin on the upside and the downside and then the, um, the negative publicity and the, the fear that a conventional investor, an institutional investor would have to buy Bitcoin is, uh, is in large part uh, due to uh, the wild west and the wildcatters and the crypto ecosystem and uh, the sooner that we clear out that leverage and the sooner that the world starts to distinguish between crypto tokens that are securities and then Bitcoin, which is a commodity, then the sooner the industry grows up and the asset class grows up.
because we just crossed the threshold of 20,000 crypto tokens. And so there's one uh, that's clearly a commodity and there's 20,000 tokens, most of which are securities. And, um, and uh, the entire future of Bitcoin is, uh, for better or for worse, it's linked with the crypto industry. So the sooner that rationality, or rationale and order uh, comes to the crypto economy and the crypto industry, then uh, the better it's going to be for Bitcoin and the sooner that Bitcoin will emerge as a, as a mature institutional treasury reserve asset. You know, it's hard to know where Bitcoin's gonna go. It's always surprising you one way or the other. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't pick any particular price target on the downside or the upside because I don't want to disappoint myself or anybody else. Uh, I, I do focus upon the four-year moving average, and I, I think the four-year moving average reflects kind of the basis that most Bitcoin holders have in their Bitcoin. So I tend to think that as it gets close to the four-year uh, moving average, it gets a, a pretty strong base of support. But in the near term, given the fact that there's just so much leverage in the rest of the crypto ecosystem, and there are large hedge funds and large traders that have a much shorter term time horizon, they're gonna control the price in the near term. I think all you can do is just look out four years or longer and, uh, and maintain your strategy and in the difficult times just avoid getting liquidated right make sure that you're not in a leverage situation where you get forced liquidated uh during the difficult times and uh then in the good times hodl because um you know you'll generally everybody is not very good at predicting the future and so if you if you're trying to predict the future, you know, as a as a mere mortal, uh, the marketplace will probably make a fool of you. I think Bitcoin is uh, the most important technology of the decade, maybe the most important technology of the century. And I think that the key to being a superpower is being a technology leader. The reason that, uh, that the United States was a superpower in the 20th century was because they mastered oil and steel and air power and atomic power and, uh, and other forms of technology, radio, electricity. And I think that in the 21st century, if you want to remain a superpower, you have to master digital energy. And I do think right now the United States has a lead in the Bitcoin industry because of so many developments, uh, so many innovations that have taken place here in this country. So I, I, I would say it is critical uh, to the prosperity of the country and it's probably critical to the prosperity of any country in the world as time goes by. Well, I think uh, Bitcoiners forever have been saying, not your keys, not your coin. And they say, get your Bitcoin off the exchanges. So, I mean, the, the essential thing that you want to do after you acquire Bitcoin is to store it in a safe place. Now, that safe place uh, isn't, isn't always a hardware wallet. It, it might be an organization like uh, Fidelity that's a custodian that you trust, or some cold storage or some institutional grade custodian or a multi-sig arrangement with, uh, with a company that you vetted and you trust. But um, leaving, uh, leaving Bitcoin on an exchange has always been risky since Mt. Gox, so we all learned that. And I, I think that um, borrowing or, lend, or, or generating yield uh, from uh, an uh, uh, unregistered uh, or unlicensed bank is, or, or an immature bank is a risky thing to do. So, um, for example, 
uh, MicroStrategy, we took a loan from Silvergate, but Silvergate was an FDIC insured bank. And when we did that, um, the terms of the loan were such that um, we didn't transfer our Bitcoin to Silvergate Bank. We actually put it in custody and we, main, we maintained custody of it. So uh, we could have borrowed money at 0% interest if we had transferred the Bitcoin to one of these wildcat crypto banks where they would say, they give you a, a very, very cheap loan at a high loan to value, but the catch is you have to transfer your Bitcoin to, to them and then they loan it out to a third party. The challenge with that is that you take counterparty risk with the bank. If the bank fails, then you lose your Bitcoin. And then you also take the counterparty risk with uh, the counterparties of the bank that you don't know of. And so if they loan it to someone else, to a hedge fund, like three arrows, and the hedge fund fails, then you also lose your Bitcoin. So you're actually taking two layers of counterparty risk to, uh, to do business with an immature bank. Uh, and uh, it always looks good going in. They pay you a higher interest rate or they give you a cheaper loan. But the counterparty risk, when you calculate it, offsets the benefit. That's why we've never done those things. That's why we never generated yield on Bitcoin. And, and that's why we didn't uh, choose to take on those kind of loans. I, so I, I think this is a painful lesson for the industry, but it's not a surprise. I think for the, for the business to grow up, you know, we need more mature better capitalized institutions, publicly traded companies, uh, public banks, FDIC insured banks, right, uh, licensed, registered entities. And of course, uh, when, you're, when you're doing business, what you, what you want to do is always be, be careful when it looks too good to be true, right? Because when it looks too good to be true, generally it is. You know, uh, many people uh, didn't really understand Bitcoin very well. They haven't taken the time to focus on it. Uh, even today, I would say that 98% of the population hasn't spent 10 hours thinking hard about Bitcoin. So, so uh, in the year 2020, I think most people were just ignoring it. Um, they really, it wasn't really registering with them, maybe 1%. I think that uh, when we talked to our investors, what was interesting is privately, most investors were aware of Bitcoin and they thought it was a good idea. Publicly, their institutions that they're part of are, have a three to five year um, time lag from the point at which they can adopt new ideas. Um, look, if, if you're going to invest in Bitcoin, a short time horizon is four years, a mid time horizon is 10 years. The right time horizon is forever. You know, Warren Buffett said, you know, if you wouldn't hold it for 10 years, you shouldn't hold it for 10 minutes. So if you look at the course of four years, no one's ever lost money over four years holding Bitcoin. And, and if you look at, you know, uh, our experience, we started buying it at $10,000 and now it's up by a factor of four. So, so given the right time horizon, you're fine. So it's a blessing and a curse. The blessing is it makes it the most exciting, interesting thing in the financial universe everywhere in the world. And, and the curse is it can induce anxiety for people that have a short attention span or, or are focused on a narrow time horizon. I think that um, there's a lot of dynamics here. If you look at the entire uh, crypto ecosystem, you, you have, um, you have a, a, a set of regulatory uncertainty, especially regulatory uncertainty around stable coins and crypto tokens uh, and whether or not they're securities. And that creates a little bit of, of un anxiety. You have a lot of leverage offshore. Right? You have a lot of crypto exchanges that can trade with up to 20 
X leverage. And those crypto exchanges have many, many tokens that are cross-collateralized. And between them and the DeFi exchanges, you can get much higher than 20x leverage. So that's the second source of volatility. The crypto markets are almost designed to encourage volatility. And that creates kind of a love-hate relationship between the, the crypto ecosystem and the Bitcoin hodlers. The Bitcoin hodlers are holding for, you know, a decade, you know, and, and sometimes for a hundred years and sometimes for a thousand years. And yet you've got fast money hedge funds that have a tax incentive, a huge amount of leverage and massive volatility. But you have two totally different investment mentalities here. And uh, when they come together, the result is you've got, in my opinion, the world's least risky asset to hold over the next century called Bitcoin. And you've got the world's most volatile fast money market, you know, called crypto. And they're both conjoined, joined at the hip for better or for worse in the year 2022. There's a, a, a profound shared appreciation that uh, digital assets are the future of the financial industry and the United States needs to lead. And I've been pretty impressed at the support in the Senate and Congress from the administration and from regulators all around the world for this entire crypto economy. And at, in the use case as digital property, I think that uh, the regulatory treatment is pretty clear. If you sell it at a profit, you'll owe capital gains on it, just like if you sold any other property. I think that with regard to the cryptocurrencies, the stable coins like Tether and Circle, they're going to be regulated as currencies. And clearly, the administration wants to see FDIC approved and insured banks issue them. So I think that, uh, that we're going to see uh, the banking sector enter into the stable coin market um, I think that many other cryptos are deemed as securities and will be deemed as securities and they're going to be regulated as securities. I think that the marketplace is waiting to see what those expectations will be. And, and I think it's pretty clear that um, the writing is on the wall with regard to crypto exchanges, right? The SEC wants them to be to abide by the principles and the rules of national securities exchanges. And they've said that in the spot ETF denial letter that they wrote uh, and on several occasions. So I think the regulation is coming to the exchanges. I think regulation is coming to security to the crypto security tokens. I think it's I think that with regard to stable coins, this is going to be a good thing right now. The, the stable coin market is maybe one hundred and seventy billion dollars all in. It's grown dramatically, but the truth is there's a demand for trillions of dollars of US dollar stable coins. And the reason that that entire market hasn't grown by an order of magnitude is because companies like Amazon and Microsoft and government agencies aren't going to move billions of dollars of stable coins around unless they feel comfortable that Treasury and the administration endorses them. And when we see FDIC approved banks, when you see a JP Morgan issue a stable coin, you may see a trillion dollars worth of that. And let me just characterize the, the entire movement. This is a rotation from an entrepreneurial driven industry to an institutionally driven industry. And we're sitting at this point where we're crossing the chasm. And the question is, which, in, which entrepreneurs will be institutionalized and come public and, and get the appropriate regulatory licenses? Which existing institutions will choose to enter the market? Which banks, like the Silvergate banks of the world, will enter the market? And then um, there will be a shakeout. And obviously, 6,500 crypto currencies are not going to be around here in a decade. You're going to see many of these things go away as the industry shakes out and as it matures. Most of my life was leading up to this point, and I understood the power of dominant digital networks like Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple because I rode that for a decade. I also understood uh, the detriment of not being that dominant network. MicroStrategy competes against Microsoft. We compete against companies 100 times as big as us. When we got to 2020, 
what I saw was the winning strategy is digital transformation if you have the dominant network. The losing strategy is to continue to work, to work harder and ho exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. And I had a sense of the consequences if we did nothing because I had seen the demise of 99% of my competitors and I could see where we were headed if we uh, stuck with the status quo. We would have to either adopt a Bitcoin strategy or sell the company. And we, uh, and we elected to pursue Bitcoin. Yeah, we're going to buy more. Our, you know, we're, we're buying more with our cash flows. We've adopted a Bitcoin standard, Emily. That means that when we generate cash, we sweep it into Bitcoin. We've been generating, you know, anywhere from 70 to 100 million dollars of cash flow. So we will also uh, buy Bitcoin with debt. We bought Bitcoin with 1.7 billion dollars worth of convertible debt. Uh, we bought Bitcoin with a 500 million dollar senior secured note that we pay six and an eight percent interest on. We also issued a billion dollars worth of equity at the market and we converted it all into Bitcoin. So combinations of cash flow, equity, debt. The truth is I'm much more comfortable today than at any point in my business career because I feel like we have found the right strategy at MicroStrategy, right? the Bitcoin standard strategy. And, you know, I'm, I'm happier uh, going to bed every night than I ever have been because I have a mission. And my mission is to educate the world on Bitcoin. And I think I can do a lot of good doing that. And uh, the world has a need. So nothing really keeps me up at night. I'm more motivated than ever. Bitcoin is digital energy and it is the future of the internet. I think, uh, you know, they're all marketing phrases. If you actually put a layer of digital energy, or in this case, wrap Satoshis around your persona as you navigate through cyberspace, you can completely eliminate all the things that plague us in the internet. The next internet, the next version of the internet, is a layer of digital energy wrapped around digital information. You, you know, you should educate yourself first and, uh, and you shouldn't really do anything until you have a firm conviction. Then uh, do your diligence, be very uh, thoughtful about which uh, vendors that you work with and, and uh, how you move forward. And then third, take a long, uh, a long time horizon. And by the way, I, you know, the conventional view of maximalist is they think there's only one and everything else isn't. That's not the point I'm going to make. I would say we know there is, that as it, there is at least one digital property, and that is Bitcoin. If you can create a truly decentralized, non-custodial, you know, bearer instrument that is not under the control of any organization that is fairly distributed, then you might create another or multiple, and there may be others out there. But I think that uh, the frustration of a lot of people in the Bitcoin community, and, and I share this with Jack, is we could create a hundred trillion dollars of value in the real world simply by building applications on top of Bitcoin as a foundation. And so continually trying to reinvent the wheel and, uh, and create uh, competitive things is a massive waste of time and it's diversion of human, uh, human creativity. It's like we, we have an ethical good thing and now we're going to try to create a third or a fourth one 
why I, I Googled something the other day, you know, what's the most common form of mammal life on the earth? And the answer that came back was human beings. A, a, apparently, if we're just looking at mammals, the, the answer was human beings are the most common, which was very interesting to me. Property is low frequency money. So if you if I give you a million dollars and you want to hold it for a decade, you might go buy a house with it. Right? And uh, the house is low frequency money. You converted the the million dollars of economic energy into a structure called a house. Maybe and after a decade you might convert it back into energy. You might sell the house for currency. So if, uh, if I transfer $10 from me to you for a drink, and then you turn around and you buy another, right? We're vibrating on a frequency of every few hours, right? The, the energy is changing hands. But it's not likely that you sell and buy houses every few hours, right? The, the frequency of, um, of, a, of a transaction in real estate is every 10 years, every five years. It's a much lower frequency transaction. and. Um, so when you think about uh, what's going on here, you have extremely low frequency things, which we'll call property. Then you have mid frequency things, I'm gonna call them money or currency. And then you have high frequency, and that's energy. And that's why I use the illustration of, you got the building, you got the light, and you got the sound, and they're all just energy moving at different frequencies. Now, Bitcoin is magical, and it's, it is truly the innovation. It's like a singularity, because it represents the first time in the history of the human race that we managed to create a digital property, properly understood. It's, it's easy to create something digital, right? Every coupon and every skin on Fortnite and Roblox and and Apple TV credits and all these things, they're all digital something, but they're securities, right? Shares of stock are securities. Whenever anybody transfers, when you transfer money on PayPal or Apple Pay, you're transferring, in essence, a security or an IOU. Mm -hmm. And so transferring a bearer instrument with final settlement in, in the internet domain or in cyberspace, that's a critical thing. and, and Anybody in the crypto world can do that. All the cryptos can do that. But what they can't do, what 99% of them fail to do, is be property. They're securities. I guess you could say that you know, the struggle of the human condition, it, it, it catalyzes the development of new technologies one after the other. It penalizes anybody that rejects ocean power, right, gets penalized. You reject artillery, you get penalized. You reject atomic power, you get penalized. If you reject digital power, cyber power, you get penalized. And. Uh, and the, the underlying control of the property keeps shifting hands from, you know, one institution or one government to another based upon how rationally they're able to channel that energy. Would Bitcoin be at risk if all the mining was in one place and one politician could turn it off at the same time with a snap of a finger? Yes. So, 
what happens when someone does that uh, on a small part of the network? It teaches everybody else and they decentralize and they're looking for places. If, if I'm gonna invest $500 million in Bitcoin mining, don't you think I'm gonna pick a jurisdiction where they're not likely to outlaw me in the next decade? But there's, there's a reason I might wanna to go to Texas and not go to say New York. There's every single month for the past 13 months, there have been fundamental developments in the space that have made it a better idea. Every single month, every week, I almost see a new development that makes, that makes the network stronger, smarter, faster, harder. It makes it more anti-fragile. It makes it more light. It, it becomes clearer and clearer that this is the future of digital property, this is digital energy, this is the future of digital money, this is the solution to the, the problems of the world, this is a macroeconomic imperative for $500 trillion worth of capital, this is a technical imperative for everybody in the technology industry and the energy industry, and this is a moral imperative for everybody on Earth, right? So. I've just become more convicted every single week, every single month that's gone by. There's not a single thing that's happened the past 13 months that I thought caused me to think that the future was riskier or less certain. And if I'm a genius and I execute well, maybe I can stay ahead of everybody else. Maybe, maybe. But while I'm doing that, every single free dollar I can raise, I should convert to Bitcoin. Because there's many, out of 100 possibilities, there's 99 paths where you fail and Bitcoin succeeds. And there's one path where you fail, where you succeed and Bitcoin succeeds. And, you know, some people don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed, but they're not, they're not with us, right? You don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed, go do something else, you know, whatever with your life, but don't, don't try to create a Bitcoin business. So you'll be worth 2,000 Bitcoin if you disinvest your treasury. <clears throat> I think Bitcoin's going to a million next stop, right? So 2,000 times a million is pretty good. Nothing wrong with that. And if, you're, and if the business itself works, you'll be worth 4,000 Bitcoin. But if you hold 100 million in cash and the business doesn't work, you'll be worth nothing or zero. If I want to be a consumer and live in my parents' basement and order Domino's pizza and take Ubers and watch Netflix and stream YouTube, the inflation rate will be the CPI. It'll be very low. If you define inflation as the CPI, you're using simple arithmetic to describe the economy. You, can know, you, can't define, you can't describe the economy and model it with simple arithmetic any more than you could describe fluid dynamics or aerodynamics with simple arithmetic, right? The fluid is flowing around right. the airfoil. You have to have multi-dimensional you know, algebra and vector calculus to describe a complicated phenomena. The economy is a complicated phenomenon. Another way to say it is the price of everything is, is varying everywhere at different rates all the time.
Bitcoin is, is gradually demonetizing these other assets. And the idea is to return rationality, to, to make things more rational. Right? If people start buying Bitcoin instead of buying a second investment property, that price of property will go down for people that want a first home. The most important thing Satoshi did was he created this gift. He gave it to the world. I assume a he. Some people think she. Some people think it's multiple people. But Satoshi gave this gift to the world and disappeared. Satoshi's innovation is real, which is another way to say we have created truly decentralized digital property in cyberspace that is not owned and controlled by any company, any individual, or any government. We have common property para pursuit to gold or land or commodities. I think that the best way to think about Bitcoin mining versus buying Bitcoin is everybody in the world has two decisions to make. One is their business strategy and the other is their investment strategy. And the investment strategy is how do I allocate my portfolio of assets and what do I do with my free cash flows? And, and buying Bitcoin is an investment strategy. Business strategy is how do I generate cash flows? And you can have a business which is selling anything, ice cream cones, writing books, broadcast television, mining Bitcoin, mining. You can mine gold and then you can sell the gold and convert it to Bitcoin, you know? So the point is you can have, there's a million businesses. And if you're asking, you know, what would I do? My answer is you ought to be engaged in the business that you're good at, where you have assets and you have skill, where you can compete. And then you ought to, you ought to uh, set your investment strategy, you know, based upon your risk tolerance. And I would say high quality property, digital property is best. And if you can't stomach that, you know, buy analog property or big tech stocks or real estate or something. And uh, if, you, if you do it that way, then I think once you ask yourself the question, am I competitive? Am I better? Am I, am I best of the best in the world? If you are, then that makes sense to do it. If you, where you really get to this asset test is, is if you have to put your own capital into the business, you have to ask the question, is this business going to give a better yield in Bitcoin? The answer is probably no. If you don't have to put your own capital in the business, if you can go to someone else and raise millions of dollars to start up a Bitcoin mining venture, then by all means, you should do it. It's someone else's capital. Right? And so you're drawing capital into the ecosystem. So the, the right way to think of it is launch a Bitcoin bank like Silvergate, raise 480 million. Launch a Bitcoin miner, raise hundreds of millions. Launch a Bitcoin anything, you know, raise money, bring it in the ecosystem and compete. But when you have excess cash flow, sweep them into Bitcoin. That's, that would be my view on that. And if you think of it that way, then I think everything's a lot simpler. How do you save how do you save a hundred thousand dollars for a hundred years and give it to your great grandkids? You put it in the US dollar, you lose ninety-nine percent of your economic energy. If you're maybe ninety-nine point five percent. You put it in gold, gold supply doubles every thirty years. The gold bankers keep inflating the gold, maybe you lose ninety percent of your economic energy. But that would be a lucky happenstance because just about every country on earth seized the gold from their citizens in the last hundred years. Everybody, even the U.S., they take your call. Yeah. So you want to save money for 100 years. You can't do it with the currency. You can't do it with gold. Which company is going to be around 100 years? 
You want to uh, put $100,000 into real estate in Florida? Can you buy $100,000? Let's say you could. 2% tax, 2% maintenance, 4% maintenance fee, 4% of $100,000, $4,000 a year. Half-life, right? your money's not going to last 100 years. How do I preserve my property, which is economic energy, which is capital, which is money? How do I preserve that? I need something harder. Harder, right? More durable. I need a steel. I need an economic steel. Steel is concentrated metallic energy. Bitcoin is concentrated digital energy. It's, it's energy in digital form. It's vacuum-packed food. I think that smart people that are informed know they want to swap out their weak property for strong property or their weak asset for strong asset. But there's a lot of debate there, right? So you know what, what I would say. I would say every property is weaker than Bitcoin. So sell your real estate, sell your equity, sell your bonds, sell your gold, sell your silver, sell your commodities, sell your collectibles, sell everything, buy Bitcoin. When you get into this issue of currency wars, you've moved into debates between nation states. And I, I just don't think it's a good use of time. I think it's much more constructive for us to focus upon, upon um, getting people to reallocate energy from the 99% of the assets which are not currently Bitcoin and not currently digital. And if they just sweep them all to digital, right, then, then you'll get to see a rationalization of investment portfolios. But the other possibility which just turns the entire thing on its head is, what, how would you feel if you woke up tomorrow and you found out that Goldman Sachs did buy $10 billion of Bitcoin and UAE bought $20 billion of Bitcoin? Would you be angry? By the way, no. your Bitcoin would be trading at like $4 million of Bitcoin. And you could be angry and say, no, no, give that back to us. I want to go back to $50,000 Bitcoin. Look, if institutions weren't involved in Bitcoin, Bitcoin would be trading at like 8,000 right now. So I think that whenever there's a powerful entity, they create a currency that's weaker than the base layer uh, store of value money. And then the currencies, in, invariably what you end up with is a currency is a medium of exchange that is uh, inflationary and it's losing value and it's constrained. And then there's a store of value asset that uh, will hold and, and accrete value over time. The, the money decomposes into property and currency, we'll say. And I think right now, Bitcoin is really the property component of money. And then the, and, uh, the currency, you know, the US dollar is like the currency component of money. What if a hundred people got together, a hundred people with money got together and they said, we're going to create a bank in cyberspace and um, we want to put our money there and we don't trust each other, we don't trust the government, we don't trust any corporation, we don't even trust any one computer. 
So we create a program that keeps track of a ledger, 21 million coins, or shares in the bank, divisible by 100 million, called this, uh, down to a Satoshi. So 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis. You don't have to know that all you need to know is there's 21 million coin units. You can't make any more. And they wanted to create it, uh, create it so that they could, um, they could send their money to each other, to anybody in the network. They could store it for 1,000 years, 10,000 years, a million years, forever. And they don't have to trust anybody. So they created this idea of, of um, Bitcoin. It's an asset that's protected by cryptography. And it's stored on a ledger. Um, software, the software administers the ledger. The twist is we distributed the software on thousands and thousands of separate computers. Every, com every Bitcoin node is running a copy of the ledger. So everybody in the world that, that has their money in the bank has a copy of all of uh, the money in the bank and all the transactions since the beginning of time. So it's the immutable truth. Every 10 minutes, the system takes a batch of a set of, uh, of transactions and then redistributes the money based upon, upon the instructions of the owners. If I want to send you my Bitcoin, I send it and it goes to you. And every single computer on the network updates that. And they all check it cryptographically using, using uh, modern encryption. Right. If you've looked at every single banker, every time they mention, they say, well, is Bitcoin, a, is it a currency? Well, I mean, their answer is no, it's not a currency. Jerome Powell can't admit it's a currency. Christina Lagarde saying it's not a currency. And then the Bitcoin community oftentimes recoils in horror, like, yes, we are, yes, we are. Why do you want to be? Like, why can't you actually be property worth $10 million a coin and not be a currency? If I told you, you could, you could basically go from zero to $10 million a coin, and everybody will help you along the way. Every company, every government will help you along the way to become worth $10 million a coin. Or you can fight with everybody right, the entire way. And if you succeed, you'll have toppled every government and every political group and every company and destroyed the entire 20th century economy, but you'll have your currency. Like, what, what's left, right? <laughs> like, if, if I rip every single company to zero and I destroy every country and every political system, you'll have your currency. But what are you going to buy with it when every company is non-existent and every government doesn't exist, right? You, you can't even buy bullets to defend yourself in the, you know, the post-apocalyptic anarchy that follows because bullets get manufactured by companies that use accounting systems that run on dollars, right? So. So uh, I guess my point really is, it's not a battle of fight. Like ultimately, I, there's, a, there's a view. The view is, well, you know, the politicians have too much power. And they use the currency, right, uh, to, to abuse that power. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> and the solution is, you basically demonetize everything in the world that's, that's in the physical realm, and you demonetize all the currency derivatives, and you just do it gradually in such a way that every company and every government that's smart enough to buy into it benefits from it. And then one day you wake up, and instead of 60% instead of or 70% of the wealth in the world being a currency derivative, it's 10%. And you know, when 10% of the wealth in the world is a currency derivative, and the rest is like digital property, then inflation won't be so much a problem anymore.
I think that if um, the Bitcoin community just embraced the idea that uh, Bitcoin is digital property and it's going to coexist with digital currencies issued by the United States or Europe or China, then 99% of all of the resistance and friction just disappears. Now, it will replace gold, which is $10 trillion asset. Bitcoin's like a 1.2. It'll go by a factor of 10. And in, in three to five years, it'll certainly replace gold. Then it will replace indexes, right? The S&P index or bond indexes. It'll start to demonetize uh, fixed income and equity indexes that are used as a store of value. The key is the base layer of Bitcoin is like the granite underlying Manhattan. Bitcoin is a successful proof of work network that has created our first digital money. Bitcoin has done that. We can see that. There are no successful examples uh, of a proof of stake network succeeding as digital property. I, I would say the illogical thing to do in business is you, you don't worry about what happens 16 to 20 years out. If you can make a ton of money now, We just finished discussing the proof of work mining network and, and the seven layers of security, energy, technology, uh, politics, finance, the network itself, the spatial security, the temporal security. Um, so what you have is you have, have Bitcoin as a decentralized crypto asset network. And the thing that pops up a lot is, is the question of what does energy usage look like over time? And is energy usage going to keep increasing as the price of Bitcoin increases? And I've seen commentary on this. I think a lot of people get it wrong. They seem to think that as the price of Bitcoin increases, the energy usage will increase linearly. And uh, if there's a 100x increase in Bitcoin price, there's a 100x increase in energy usage. And I think it's just worthwhile to make the observation that over the past 10 years, the, the mining network has gone from being energy intensive to being technology intensive. Uh, the mobile payment space is particularly promising because all these mobile applications are one step removed from being mobile banks. And there's no reason why, you know, Facebook and Apple and Google and the like don't eventually become mobile banks. Like, it was a matter of time before they let you send photos. And then at some point they decided to let you send videos. And then they decided they give you emojis. And uh, then they decided they'd let you send audio files. And in a way, you could think of Bitcoin, you know, as just another file type. We've got history on our side. Bit by bit, every quarter, every year, more and more the world embraces this, the world opens up, and I think that uh, I think there's no doubt where the trend is going.